afternoon and welcome to the CLEAR webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is going to focus on groundwater and we have with us Dr. Gary Robbins from our college and he's from the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment which is one of the partners of CLEAR. And so um, this is the final presentation in the 2016 webinar series. You can see our past webinars listed on the screen there and all of those have been recorded and are archived on our website which is clear.ucon.edu and so if you are here for the Groundwater 101 webinar you are in the right place. So and those of you who are new to CLEAR we are the Center for Land Use Education and Research here at UConn. Uh, we basically our mission is to provide information education and assistance to municipalities primarily primarily and helping them make good land use decisions and sort of our work um, along those lines focuses on three general areas, land use and climate resilience, uh, water with a bit of a focus on stormwater issues, and uh, more recently with a focus on the new MS4 permit, as well as geospatial technology and training. So that's the quick introduction to the webinar series, and now I will turn it over to Dr. Gary Robbins, who will lead our presentation today on groundwater in Connecticut. Good afternoon, everyone. So let's just uh, start right in. Um, the objective of this uh, webinar is to improve public understanding of groundwater and uh, we'll also uh, uh, provide an overview of Connecticut's groundwater resources. The topics listed here I'll be going through one by one and I would suggest if you have questions dealing with any individual topic that, that would be the time to, to, uh, to write them in. So we'll start with talking about just what is groundwater. Now I know most of you, if not every one of you, have gone to the beach, okay, like these girls right here, and dug into the sand and encountered water. Um, and probably thought that that water that you encountered was actually the ocean, okay? How many, how many of you have done that? Okay, talk to yourselves. I know that, uh, that that's true, okay? When in fact, that's not the ocean water that you dug into, that was actually the groundwater. In fact, uh, very. it's probably one of the few places that people actually get a chance to see the groundwater in the ground. Okay, so, so let's just define what groundwater is. If you were to actually, anywhere in this state, for example, uh, dig a hole in the ground, this is what you'd encounter. At first you'd be seeing sediment and soil, eventually you'd reach rock. And if you actually took a sample of the shallow soil, this is what you'd see. You'd see grains of sand, maybe some organic matter, uh, and then some water in the soil and some air space, so what we call void space. This is the zone we call the unsaturated zone or the Vado zone. If you kept digging, okay, eventually you come to a place where all the pore space is filled with water. That water is what we call the groundwater, and the demarcation between the two is basically the water table. Now, if you kept digging even further, eventually you'd hit the rock, and then in the rock you'd see water uh, migrating down through the fractures and we'll come back time and time again and talk about water in the rock. All right, so where does the water come from that gets into the ground and where ultimately is it going? Uh, the groundwater, of course, is part of the hydrologic cycle. Uh, you have uh, basically water condensing from clouds and, and then subsequently precipitating onto the land uh, and some of that water leaves the land by evapotranspiration through various vegetation. Some of it runs off the land, uh, and some of it actually infiltrates, becomes soil moisture, and some of that soil moisture eventually works its way down uh, to the saturated zone to become groundwater. Now, groundwater, of course, is part of the hydrologic cycle. It's a renewable resource, uh, but the thing I want you to keep in mind is it's always moving, okay, and the water table, the demarcation between the unsaturated zone and saturated zone is either rising or falling. It's never constant, so it's either going up or going down, and we'll see this later on. This is a nice uh, picture. It's uh, from a U.S. Geological Survey report, and it gives you sort of an idea of what the typical uh, flow conditions uh, are in, in, uh, in the Connecticut area, particularly close to our surface water bodies. I wonder how many of you have ever wondered, if you were standing by a stream uh, and it wasn't raining, where, in fact, was the water coming from? All right. I bet you very few of you actually thought of this, but nonetheless, uh, uh, what I'd like you to appreciate is the fact that that water is actually coming from the ground. It's groundwater, and groundwater is important because it forms the base flow of streams. When it's not raining and there's water in that stream and there's no runoff, 
then the water you're seeing is basically groundwater coming to the surface as illustrated uh, in this in this diagram. It's very, very important, as you can imagine, from the standpoint of uh, maintaining uh, streams ecology. Now, some of the water, if you look here, this is sort of a cross-section of the of what our highland areas look like. You basically have rock on top of a hill, and then you have uh, soil, which I, which I label here as till, and I'll come back and talk about what that is. But here, too, water will get down, go through the till, work its way down through fractures or cracks in the rock uh, in a very circuitous path, and, and ultimately either end up uh, coming to some local stream or some other stream down, uh, down gradient, or uh, eventually into Long Island Sound. And again, the water is always moving. Okay, so let's look at what factors influence water storage and, and its transmission. Uh, water storage in the soil depends on basically the three factors defined here. If you looked at the, diet, the picture first at the right, just imagine the soil is composed of a whole bunch of grains of little tiny rock. And, uh, and in between those grains is pore space. And so the amount of water you can store in that soil depends on the volume of, of saturated pore space, the interconnectedness of the space, and basically the size of the voids. And we're not talking then about underground streams here. We're talking about water migrating through the pore space of sand and gravel. Now, when you get into the rock, the water storage in the rock is dependent on the number of fractures, the width of these fractures. That's a very critical, uh, critical uh, item, how wide those fractures are, and the interconnectedness of fractures to not only each other, but ultimately to the soil where the water is actually coming in. Now, in terms of transmission of water, that is how fast does the water move through the environment, uh, this is what we describe as, uh, or is described as permeability. And that is a measure of how readily water is transmitted through earth materials. Now, like storage, permeability depends on things like the grain size, okay, the grain size distribution, which influence the pore size uh, of the materials, and then, of course, the continuity of that pore space, because these things influence friction. And, uh, at, but the thing I want you to appreciate is that the permeability of soils and rocks varies by many, many orders of magnitude in nature. And the velocity of water through this material, how much you can pump out of this material, how fast the water is moving from place to place, and where it goes is very much dependent on the permeability. Uh, I have two examples illustrated here. One is coarse gravel. For example, this is coarse gravel near one of our streams. Where here the velocity is estimated to be about 94 feet per day pretty rapid for groundwater. On the other extreme, we have clay deposits. This is up there near East Windsor, and they have permeabilities on the order of point, uh, I mean, they have velocities on the order of 0.034 feet per year. Basically, once water gets in, it doesn't really get out, at least not in our lifetime. Now, in terms of the fractured rock, which becomes very important, uh, the uh, how uh, readily the fractured rock is going to actually transmit water Okay, it depends on the width of the fractures, the wider the width, the faster the water is going to flow, because again, it's a question of reducing friction. And the other is the continuity. How continuous are these fractures from place to place? Now, another important feature that illustrates that or influences how water flows and its velocity is the water elevation. Okay, you can think of a water elevation as a measure, a measure of energy. Imagine, look at this cross section for a moment. Uh, down at the bottom is sea level, uh, and then what I'm going to do is put in a well, and the uh, water has a certain water elevation as indicated by that red, that red arrow. Okay, and uh, um, so that elevation is actually a measure of energy, the energy in the, uh, of that water. And water flows basically from high energy to low energy. That is, water basically flows from uphill to downhill. Okay, and uh, and uh, so how, how readily water is going to flow depends on the slope, basically, of the water table, if you will, okay, or the slope of the water elevation from place to place to place. And this is a very important factor. For example, this is a water table map. Uh, what you're looking at is a topographic map superimposed on a topographic map of these green dots. The green dots represent uh, water wells, and, uh, and then the brown lines represent elevation contours of the water table. And you can see water is basically, based on those arrows, water is flowing in the downhill towards the rivers in, in different directions. And maps like this are very important. If you want to know where the, where's the water coming from, where's the water going, uh, if there's a spill of contamination in one place, wh which way will it move, how will it move, things like this. 
uh, very important uh, to develop maps like this. And uh, but uh, again, very important uh, water elevation, very important in terms of its movement. Now. In fractured rock, for example, there's another factor, and this relates to confining pressure in the in the rocks. You can think of our fractured rock as very much like a hose, okay? And that is, you have a, a fracture or a crack, and the crack is in between two low permeable units. So if you think about water coming in from a highland high area and moving towards a low area, basically it's like holding a hose up in the air, and water is actually going down the down the hose. So if you actually penetrated an aquifer like this or, or, or a fracture like this with a well, then the wood is going to rise because it's under pressure, just like a hose. If you took a needle and stuck it in a hose, the water is going to actually shoot out. It's the same type of thing. So it's not unusual if you look at our water wells here in fractured rock, you might have a well that's several hundred feet deep, but the water level in the well is actually only, only say, 40, 50, or you know, 20 to 50 feet, for example. Okay, and then again, the water will move from high elevation to low elevation, just like water is moving in a hose from high pressure to low pressure. Now, if it turns out the land surface is below where the water level will rise in one of these wells, you can get a flowing well. Now, flowing wells are not that common here in Connecticut. In other places they are, uh, but oftentimes we might find them if you drill a bedrock well uh, very close to, well, down in the valley, very close to a stream. Um, and the water basically is flowing up into that stream, you might actually see a, a flowing well. All right, so let's define aquifers now that we have this basic understanding of, uh, of groundwater. So what is an aquifer? Well, an aquifer simply is just a geologic unit uh, that provides usable quantities of water. And I emphasize usable as it relates to both quantity and quality, and it's a relative term. All right, sometimes you need a lot of water, for example, in the case of pumping a municipal well, uh, you, you, sands and gravels become your aquifer, uh, fracture rock is not. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a single uh, home and you're only pumping a few gallons or less than a gallon um, a minute out of, the, out of that material, that, then that fracture rock becomes an aquifer. Okay, so it's, it's, it's relative. Also, the, the, the water quality is another factor. That is, you would expect to see, if, if you're calling something an aquifer, you'd expect the water to be potable, and that is at least you'd be able to drink it. And there are different types. We have water table aquifers around here. Typically, on average, the water table is only about 15 feet, although it does vary from place to place, but on average. And, and then we have what we call confined aquifers, and our confined aquifers are basically the fractures in the rock, okay? All right, so I want to sort of turn and just give you an idea then, given that basic information, um, what does a, a well do for us and how do wells work, okay? All right, so this is a, what you're seeing here is a house being constructed and a water well is being drilled um, and all that. I want to show you how a typical bedrock well uh, is, is actually drilled here. Uh, basically, if you look on this slide, in the middle on the lower portion is, is, is a is an idealized cross-section of the earth going from sky into the soil into the rock. All right, and the way that the drillers typically work here is they start with that tricone drill bit. That's the one on the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and they'll drill that down into the rock. So you just drill the hole from the surface uh, down into the rock. Then they'll take this casing with a drive shoe and they'll bang that down into the rock. So you might only be five feet into the rock. That's all. That's, that's pretty typical. All right, and that forms the black case that you see on your well that comes up to the surface, okay? Then they'll go in with that air hammer, okay? This is air percussion drilling, and they'll drill down, uh, you know, th through the middle of that casing uh, into the rock and basically create a hole in the rock. And that hole is basically your water well. That's it. Your water well is nothing but a hole in the rock that intersects basically fractures. And this is illustrated here. If you look at that picture to the right, you see there's a, this is actually a blasting hole, but it gives you an idea of what your well would look like if you went underground. It's just basically a hole that intersects uh, a fracture, okay? And hopefully those, fra or, or those fractures have, uh, have water in them. If you look at the diagram on the lower left, you can see that's the way the casing is, and underground would be your water pipe that would lead to your house, and then you'd have electric lines coming up to the surface and going back down. Okay, I wanted to say a few things about pumps, not much, but you know, typically if you're dealing with a dug well or, very, or a well where the water table is really shallow, 
you'll be using surface uh, centrifugal pumps or surface venturi pumps. But these only have a capacity of basically pumping water up about 25 feet or so. So they're very vulnerable to variations in water level. Okay, seasonally, and, and I know now we've been going through a very significant drought, and you might actually be experiencing a problem uh, in terms of your well, and oftentimes that problem is because the water level is dropped, okay, below basically 25 feet. For those of you who have deep wells, for example, uh, um, we typically use submersible pumps, and uh, these are lowered in the well maybe 50 feet or so off the bottom, uh, and, and both of these types of pumps uh, can you know, have the capacity to pump you know, maybe up to 10 or 15 gallons a minute, but this depends on the depth in which you're pumping from. Okay, now the water is then pumped to a tank. Uh, if you go down your basement, you see this, and, uh, and basically you have a pressure controller that's monitoring the water pressure in that tank. Now, when the water comes into the tank, if you look at the middle diagram, uh, basically the water goes into a rubber bladder, okay, that blows up as, the, as it's filled with water. And what you have between the bladder and the walls of the tank is air pressure, okay? If you actually look at the top of the tank, you'll see a little uh, um, um, a nozzle, just like on a, a bicycle or a air tire, where you actually can, can actually fill the air up, okay? And basically, it's that air that squeezes the rubber bladder that gives you your uh, pressure in your house when you open up the tap or your, or your, uh, or your shower. Now, from there, then, the water uh, you know, goes off into the rest of the system, uh, the pressure controller is monitoring the pressure. If the water, if pressure gets low, it t kicks on the pump. The pump kicks, you know, puts water into the tank, and so forth and so on. And then you might have some some filter system. Uh, particulate filters are very common here. We have in some places a lot of iron in the water, and people will put particulate filters on. Some places there's water softeners and a whole variety of other filters depending on the water conditions. But by and large, the water here is excellent. All right, now. On the large scale, if you're talking about a pumping well, like a municipal pumping well, these typically are casing plus screen wells. They're, what you see on this picture is uh, somebody's fastening a uh, screen. This is basically a stainless steel um, um, a casing or a stainless, well, it's a stainless steel screen uh, with holes in it uh, or slits in it that allows water to get into the well, and then that's attached to casing, and that would be actually put in the sanding, a hole that was made in the sand and gravel, for example. Okay, and then inside that would go a series of, uh, would be your, your, your pump, and the pump, in this case, these are uh, um, turbine pumps, and basically you have pump balls as shown here in this picture um, uh, from, a, this is a well graveyard from Las Vegas, by the way, and, uh, and so um, you would basically lower the, the intake and pump balls into the, into the well, and this acts, it basically is based on centrifugal forces, and, uh, and they spin, and they spin the water up, uh, to the surface and on top is uh, basically a gigantic electric motor and these wells can pump hundreds of gallons a minute. Here's an example of uh, what the turbine pump on the surface looks like. This is uh, one of the pumps from, from Yukon that pumps several hundred gallons a minute. That's very typical of a municipal, municipal well. Okay, and then on top of that you have housing. If you look at the picture to the upper right, it's one of our uh, well houses. So you, you have a house there that protects basically the, your, your, uh, elect, your electronics and, uh, and, uh, and your pump um, and your pump motor and things of this nature. Okay, and then you have plumbing of various kinds uh, and then a tank, usually some large tank for, that provides pressure. And then there's water treatment. And again, the, most of our sand and gravel aquifers that are, that are used uh, in this manner um, have very good quality water. So there's very little that's done. Typically they add chlorine uh, and then it's readjust the pH, okay, and that's it, um, and then we drink it. All right, so let's look at what pumping does to the groundwater when you're actually, uh, when you turn on that pump, okay? So this is what happens. If you look in this series of diagram diagrams, you start out at time zero. You have, let's say you have a relatively flat water table uh, right by your well. Then you turn it on, and the pump starts sucking water out of that well faster than nature can put that put that water back in. So the water level in the well goes down. Early on then you start to get what we call a cone of depression form. Basically it looks just like a cone in the surface of the water and that cone basically continues to grow and grow and grow okay, until uh, uh, a, a balance is reached between the amount of water you're pumping out and the amount of uh, water nature is putting back in. Okay. 
if you look at this from a map point of view, this is what it might look like. When you start out, you get a small cone of depression, and then the cone of depression gets larger and larger and larger. And then if things were very flat, the water table was very flat, you'd basically get a circular looking uh, cone of depression, okay, as shown here. Okay, now, if it's not flat, you get something else. And, and this is sort of illustrated, this is part of a modeling study uh, we performed, but if you look here, there's, a, there's actually a natural gradient. Water is flowing naturally from, from, let's say, the top, there's a map view from the top, which is north to south, as, as shown by those arrows, and the little square represents a pumping well. So if you turn on this well, this is what happens. Okay, that's the way the water comes in. If you follow these little arrows here, it's like little putting little particles in the water and tracking it, okay? You can see you get this, instead of nice circular shape, you get a different type of capture zone, like a sort of an elliptical type of, of capture zone as sort of defined by this orange uh, this orange line. And this is very, very important, and our state is pretty advanced in this in, in terms of uh, uh, wellhead protection, how to protect a well, because if you model a, a well like this, okay, you can develop a, a, a protection area, for example, and uh, that's what you see here. This is a aquifer protection zone uh, that was defined, and and now through uh, you can identify what the potential threats might be. That is everywhere in that red, in that in that blue uh, uh, line. There is the, we call the, the area of contribution. Water will actually go from there to the well. Okay, and again, it depends on the conditions at a particular spot. But now through planning and zoning, you can actually enact. Uh, regulations that actually protect that zone, okay, in terms of the kinds of facilities you want who are allowed to be constructed there. <clears throat> now another thing also I wanted to mention is many of our wells, since the, the more permeable area here, as you'll see, is, is, is located near our surface water bodies. Uh, if you uh, start pumping these wells, typically what happens is you can actually induce recharge, and that is some of the water from the actual surface water body Okay, which was originally receiving groundwater, actually now will actually reverse, and water from that surface body can actually go into the ground. This is called induced recharge to your well. And oftentimes this actually constrains the amount of water you can actually pump in a given location. That is, in order to maintain a, a, a proper amount of stream flow, if you will, that's, uh, that's good for the ecology, okay, then uh, that you might have to set your pumping limits, and this is commonly done. I know at UConn we do this. We have we're monitoring uh, surface water discharge, and when the discharge gets to certain levels, we start cutting back our pumping as a means of maintaining uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the environment, okay, uh, of the stream. Okay, so let's look at then factors that influence water quality. So it's not just how much water, but you know. What influences our water quality? When we talk about water quality, we're talking about uh, uh, bulk uh, chemical composition of the water. This is basically the material that's dissolved in the water. Um, we're talking about suspended material, although normally we have very little suspended solids in the water. And then, of course, there's all kinds of microorganisms, okay, also that naturally live in uh, naturally live in groundwater, okay. Now, there's a whole variety of factors that actually influence the composition of the water, but I only want to really mention uh, one here, and that is the, the solubility of minerals or the dissolution of minerals. As the water is actually traveling in the ground, it starts to dissolve out minerals, okay, of, of various kinds. Well, it turns out, at least here, most of our minerals here are silica, what we call silicate minerals, and they have extremely low solubilities. So the end result here, I'd say, in comparison to say some place like Florida, okay, that the end result is that we get very little dissolved material in our water, and again, it's one of the reasons why the water in our state is just so good. Okay, so if you would actually take a sample of water and actually send it off to uh, to a laboratory, this is pr pretty much what you'll find. Uh, about 90% of what's actually dissolved in the water is basically those eight things shown there. Okay, those are our major ions: calcium, magnesium, sodium potassium bicarbonate, uh, chloride, sulfate, and some dissolved silica. That's basically most things, okay? Then there might be some minor uh, constituents of various levels um, as well. And typically, as the water is traveling along, as you might imagine, it's going to pick up more and more and more material. And, uh, and so typically what you see is the pH increases. If you look at the pH of shallow water, which usually is about six and change, the pH of, of of water in the rock, it's about over seven, 
as a result of the pH increasing uh, or, or with neutralizing acidity, and then uh, sol dissolved solids increase, that sort of thing, and then dissolved oxygen diminishes as a result of the microorganisms in the ground basically consuming oxygen. So there are trends. The water quality varies naturally from place to place. Okay, now I'm going to, given that introduction, so to speak, that long introduction, I'm now going to talk about aquifer conditions in the state. Okay, this is a bedrock map of the state. Um, uh, as you probably know, uh, we have rocks in the state that go from several hundred millions of years to, to a few, uh, to a maybe a hundred million years or so. Uh, these rocks have been exposed to various types of tectonic events, that is the continents colliding over and over again over geologic time, and that has created not only the bedrock but also the fracturing in that rock, which becomes very important from the standpoint of groundwater. Okay, if we looked at the rock first, if, and that's a, the purple areas, or it might look pinkish to you on, the, on your slide, okay, uh, or your screen, uh, that's our metamorphic rock. These are rocks that have been subject as a result of these continental collisions to very high temperatures and pressures. The pre-existing material has recrystallized. Basically, all the pore space is gone, okay, and there really is no matrix permeability in these rocks at all, okay, and uh, uh, basically, if you want to get water out of them, as illustrated here, you have to hit the fractures in them or weathered rock. That's it. That's where the water's hiding. Okay, now in the middle of the state we have sedimentary rocks, and often sedimentary rocks are very good uh, aquifers and sources of water. In our case, these rocks, these are rocks that are formed from the transport deposition and cementation of, uh, of pre-existing rocks, and, and here these rocks are so, in our state, are so well cemented that they also have very little matrix permeability, and here too the water is in the fractures and weathered rock. Okay, so by and large then, uh, for most of the state, this is a truism. Okay, we're talking if you have if you go into the rock, we're looking at fracture rock hydrology. Okay, and that and another type of rock we have here and there is igneous rocks. These are rocks that are formed uh, uh, from the cooling of uh, molten lava, if you will, and uh, sometimes shallow, sometimes very deep in the earth. And here too, it's this same story. Uh, these rocks have no matrix permeability, and again, you're talking about fracture. So by and large, then uh, for uh, Connecticut, uh, when we talk about uh, the rock, or what they call bedrock uh, fracture aquifer, we're talking about a myriad of fractures all over the place, uh, and water seeps down from the soil above and gets into these, into these fractures. So that's what we mean by the fracture rock aquifer. And if you have one of these fracture rock wells, you're getting water, okay, from these fractures. Okay, now let's uh, look at the, 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 the surficial material that we see. Sometime between about 2 million to about 10,000 years ago, the state was covered uh, with over a mile of ice, uh, uh, glacier ice, and then the glaciers began to retreat, maybe about 20,000 years ago or so. And uh, this is a map of basically the states basically showing you it was ice covered, except for a portion that had actually a glacial, a large glacial lake. Okay, and then as that ice retreated, it left tongues of ice, okay, um, uh, in valleys and, uh, and, and, and all as it was leaving. And uh, as the ice melted, uh, you know, previously when the ice came on, uh, it actually scraped off all the pre-existing soil and, or surficial material. And then as the ice was retreating, it just deposited um, just a hodgepodge of rocks and soil and whatever um, on the ground, okay. And uh, this material we call till, and this is illustrated here from uh, the Columbia Ice Field up in Canada. This is a close-up view of uh, um, ice uh, deposits from uh, Horse Barn Hill at the University of Connecticut. Um, it's, uh, we call, as I said, we call this till. It has a very low permeability because it has a very, very fine grain matrix. Uh, and so you can get, you can get water in, uh, but it's very difficult to get that water out, okay, um, as a result of this fine grain material, okay. Now, as the glaciers were melting in these valleys, uh, rivers were basically rivers of water were coming out of them at very, very high energies, and these rivers of water were carrying sediments. The sediment was sorted out, uh, fines basically went very far and maybe out into the Long Island Sound, and the coarser material was eventually deposited. Oops. And uh, and this is a, a map of our sand and gravel deposits in New England and New York. It has the yellow areas there, are basically where the high permeable zones are. Okay, 
and they're basically concentrated in our sands and gravels with the exception of Cape Cod and Long Island. This is an example from, uh, from Connecticut. This is a very high energy sand and gravel deposits, enormous permeability, okay, um, um, that we can uh, uh, derive for hundreds of gallons a minute of water out of. This is somewhat a lower uh, sort of energy environment, but still lots of sand, very permeable, um, and all, and again, you can get at least tens of gallons a minute out of that. Now, this is a superficial map of the state, okay, and uh, and what it shows, if you look at the the gr the green areas and uh, and the the green areas and uh, the blue areas, basically, those are uh, and that constitutes about 70% of the state. Those are the tills or, or finer grain stratified drip deposits in which you cannot really get uh, productive uh, amounts of water out of. Okay, and then, and so those are the areas where you really, if you want water, you go into the rock for that water. Okay, on the other hand, the yellow areas here are basically where our, uh, our coarse grain stratified drift deposits are that you can get very high uh, production rates out of. Okay, so let's look at groundwater usage then in the state. How much are we using um, and how to sustain that, uh, that use? This is a water budget. Uh, it's a, basically based on average information. Clearly, the amount of water we have available actually varies throughout the year um, and all. But on average, for example, in our stratified drift deposits, we get, we get well, first off, over the state, we get about 47 inches of water a year. And, uh, um, and, and in our stratified drift deposits, we get very little runoff. So we get a very large amount of, or high amount of, uh, of uh, groundwater recharge. So about 23 inches a year is actually recharging the, the sand and gravel. And, and that gives you about 1,788 million gallons a day, okay, of water. Now, in the tills, even though it's less permeable, it's over a much larger area. So you get almost a comparable amount of recharge. That's about 1,542. But again, remember that the permeability basically restricts usage. It's there, and, you know, that water is important because ultimately much of that gets into the bedrock and forms the bedrock aquifers. This is a very interesting diagram here. These are hydrographs, okay? Basically what you're seeing is depth to water versus time. The orangish yellow um, uh, sinusoidal wave there is basically the, the average um, uh, change in water level uh, throughout the year. So those, those are, are the same from year to year to year to year because it's averaged over the entire history of the record. So we have two wells here. If we look at the one on the lower right, that's 82 feet into tail. That's sort of uh, it's more than a dug well, but for sure, but nonetheless, uh, it's still into, into sediment. Um, and you can see, for example, if you look at both of these diagrams, the, the water table, uh, the water level is not constant ever. It's always moving up or it's moving down, okay? And, uh, and uh, as you can see, it tends to have its lowest level um, in about September, October, typically, okay? But interestingly enough, on both of these wells, you can see that since basically about 2012, our, our, our fall, the water levels are getting lower and lower and lower, okay, and presumably as a result of uh, a lack of, uh, of a certain amount of snow or, or, significant, or su a sufficient amount of snow um, early on in the winter, okay, but nonetheless, things are falling. If you note the one on the right, the water level is actually falling below 25 feet, so it shouldn't be surprised that if you have one of these types of wells, okay, you know, your well is going to be run dry. You're not going to be able to, it may still have water in there, but you won't be able to pump it up if you have a surface pump, okay? But the other thing I wanted you to see, if you have a bedrock well, for example, that one's in 350 feet, if you look at the typical normal variation in, in water level, it's only about 15 feet, and even under this extreme condition where the water level has gone down, let's say, over maybe over 25 feet, still you have plenty of water in there, okay, because the well goes down to 350 feet, and if you have fractures, they'll fill up that well, okay? It's an advantage of having a, a basically a, a drilled well in the state, okay? So in terms of water usage, we have a population of about uh, 3.5 million. Uh, we use only about, two, according to USGS, only about 216 million gallons a day, or that's only 6.4% of the available water based on the previous di two diagrams I showed you, okay? Uh, in terms of domestic wells, about 23% of the state relies on domestic wells, and, and according to the health department, uh, we have about 322,000 domestic wells in the state, and I estimate those wells are pumping at about a total of about 97 million gallons a day, 
again, uh, if you can look at that number in relation to 216, so the difference would be the, the amount of wells that are, that are public supply wells pumping at high levels. But in terms of the domestic wells, uh, one of the problems is we really don't know how many of these wells we have, okay? And, uh, uh, and the reason is that we don't track private well information very rigorously. Uh, unlike other states that have uh, e-databases and all, the, the state of Connecticut does not. Uh, although we've been suggesting this for many years, and in fact, they're working on a uh, app, okay, that would be very helpful in this regard, okay. And again, the state has we have about 2,400 public supply wells. So if you look at this number, 6.4 percent, we we actually have a lot of excess water most of the time, not all the time, okay, but most of the time, okay. And this brings me to how can we take advantage of our our abundant renewable groundwater? Um, uh, to help the state's economy, and I, I'd like to look at this as Connecticut's groundwater, the gold beneath our feet, okay? And uh, and and that is what I'm looking for, and 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 I and I break, I send I send this out to all of you as it's almost a challenge to consider, and that is uh, how do we go about providing incentives for water-intensive industries to actually come to the state, okay? And and this is just a list of industries. You all know that there are many electronic industries, for example. Uh, or manufacturers out in California where they have terrible problems finding water, um, and why not provide an incentive for those industries to come here? And I think if you do it right, uh, both in terms of, uh, of uh, providing the, the, the correct or proper economic incentives, and then of course you, you, you're, you're mindful of environmental protection, I think you could do this and, and basically help the state's economy. Okay, lastly, I want to just talk about another aspect of, of environmental or, or water sustainability and protection is potential sources of contamination. I'm not going to go through every one, but I just want to say a few words about a few of these. Okay, one is that, you know, I want you all to appreciate that there are naturally occurring contaminants, particularly in the rock. Um, and, uh, you can find iron and manganese. In some places in the state, we have high levels of uranium, radium, and radon. In other places, we might have a low pH because there's uh, sulfate in the in the rock. Uh, in some places, there may be arsenic. In other places, we we may have fluoride. So there are naturally other things that may occur depending on the nature of the rock. Okay. Another contributor to uh, uh, to uh, problems is septic fields. We have many septic fields in the state. Basically, if we have 322,000 wells, we probably have 322,000 septic fields. A number of that nature. And uh, uh, and then and, and these uh, can generate nitrate uh, as well as uh, anything else you actually flush down the toilet and I always advise people to just be careful what you do because you have to appreciate what you flush down there could actually get into the groundwater and ultimately affect your neighbors. Agricultural pollutions are, are pollutants are another thing uh, uh, here we generate nitrate uh, uh, from fertilizers from animal waste uh, um, and, and phosphates as well and historically in the past uh, we've we've put uh, various pesticides and herbicides on the ground that uh, uh, could still exist in various places. I know in parts of the Central Valley we have ethylene dibromide problems and other places there may actually be arsenic from lead arsenic that was placed on uh, on apple trees. And then of course there's hormones that, that we used to put in cattle and things like this that end up on the ground and could seep into the ground. Okay, another problem, this is a problem that we're working on very diligently at UConn, uh, and that is salting. Uh, we're using, uh, obviously, salt for de-icing, uh, and this is having a significant impact to groundwater. If you look on this, this, this slide, the, the, the figure to the upper right is a map that was created in 1902 that shows basically the, uh, the chloride concentration uh, in the groundwater, which was only about 2.2 uh, 2 milligrams per liter on, uh, on average. If you look at the figure to the lower left, okay, this is basically what it is almost today, as at least when our last study ended, looking at this statewide in 2007, that is we have now 10 times the amount of salt distributed around the state on average, and in some places 100 times that, okay, as well. And, uh, and we're finding this more and more and more, uh, salt contamination. So this is, I think, is a, a significant problem to be worked on in the future, trying to reduce uh, this type of problem, yet at the same time, uh, recognize the need for salting uh, um, as it uh, impacts uh, our road safety. Another problem that was very uh, pervasive in the past were fuel releases at service stations uh, and other facilities. 
and I have to tell you, I, you know, I have a lot of experience dealing with this particular problem, but over the years things have gotten much, much better and the probability of releases now I think is much, much lower and, and, um, and things are much safer today. And, and the reason I say that is uh, today there's uh, a lot of bells and whistles that go into these facilities. We have double wall tanks, double wall pipelines, all kinds of spill protection that wasn't used in the, in the past. Uh, we have testing now, this uh, inspections are required and tank testing and line testing and things like this. In addition, we have monitoring for fuel releases uh, uh, and all. We have continuous monitoring and today we even have, tra uh, we train operators uh, as to what to do if, the, if one of the bells go off and tells them that they might have a, they might have a, a problem. Lastly, I think um, I wanted to just mention this, uh, and this is emerging contaminants. Um, uh, ECs here, uh, these are contaminants that uh, we never looked for in the past and now we're looking for them and, and what we're finding things in the water at very low levels that we, that uh, to some extent have surprised us like plasticizers and, and detergents, uh, uh, prescription dr and non-prescription drugs and various types of veterinary and human hormones and things of this nature and, uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of work being done by scientists all over including UConn uh, looking at uh, this problem. Okay, with that, I thank you very much, and if there's time for more questions. Yeah, so okay. uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robbins. And so we do have a couple questions that have come in already. And so again, folks, if you have questions, um, this is your opportunity to ask, you know, sort of the guru in Connecticut on groundwater, um, any questions you may have. Uh, so type them into the question box that's on your toolbar on your screen. So the first question we have is um, someone's heard that parts of Long Island Sound or Long Island have had problems with saltwater uh, infiltration into the groundwater. Have we had this problem in Connecticut? Um, and could you elaborate more on you know how that happens? All right. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, basically, what happens when you have an island or you're near the coast, uh, you tend to uh, develop a, a so kind of an interesting dynamic, and that is under the ground. If you were to drill, you'd come across a first through a freshwater lens, and freshwater being lighter than salt water would actually float on salt water, and then underneath that would be salt water. And basically the freshwater lens, the thickness of that lens holds the salt water down. Now if you start pumping freshwater out and start reducing that lens size, okay, the, the, it changes the pressure conditions that causes the salt water to rise, and that's what cre re creates uh, salt water intrusion problems. A difficult problem by the, by the coast, um, and, and all. There's a related problem also, and that is uh, uh, would uh, sea level rise actually have an impact on this? And the answer is yes. Again, it's all pressure, and if you have a rise in sea level that raises the, the, the freshwater saltwater interface underground closer to the surface, okay, and I would imagine that would help exacerbate the problem. Um, and so the, the next question is how does dousing work? That's an interesting question. There's no scientific basis for dowsing. Okay, people have done all kinds of experiments with this. Um, as a scientist, I will tell you, there's just no basis, uh, in fact, that dowsing, in fact, works. And this is the idea of somebody walking around with a stick. They can right, where sticks. The water there's is. there's sticks. There's all kinds of other devices that you can use uh, to look for water. Sometimes you have two metal rods and you're waiting for them to cross, and you somehow or other you magically feel the force of some sort. Um, and uh, and I know there are people out there that believe in dowsing. There's all kinds of stories about dowsing, uh, but as I said, there's no scientific basis for it. People have tried experiments of various kinds, uh, and all have failed to prove that dowsing actually is a worthwhile endeavor. So, um, next question is for an aquifer protection area. How do you define this? Well, actually, I don't define this, but the Department of Environmental Pro uh, Energy and Environmental Protection actually defines the procedure by which you determine uh, the, the zone of contribution or the area of contribution uh, of a pumping well. Okay, that's in our state, we, we, we call it aquifer protection areas, but it's really uh, uh, wellhead protection areas. Basically, you, you, it's primarily uh, found by modeling. We, we put out a series of wells, monitoring wells, uh, turn on pumps, this sort of thing. We do the studies, and then we use various types of models to actually model the, the water conditions that take into account uh, things like the permeability and rainfall and things like that. And from that, they can define the uh, 
the, um, the what we call the zone of capture or the the uh, zone of or the area of aquifer protection. Okay, and the next one is in uh, in what distance does leachate from septic systems become filtered through to be potable? Filtered enough to be potable. Sorry. Leachate. I think I understand this. I think that it, basically the question is, if you're if you're putting nitrates in the ground, how far away do you have to be, okay, before yeah. the the nitrates dilute? And and you, I don't think you can answer that directly. Uh, and there are some regulations to this effect, uh, but the the it just really depends on the site conditions. How how much are you, are you putting out there? Um, uh, for example, you can have a single residence, or maybe it's a combined residence that has one septic field that matters. Um, uh, you know what the permeability of the soil is like that actually has that effect. So I don't think you can be arbitrary per se about this. And as I said, I I know uh, deep in the Department of Health have uh, uh, you know regulations that uh, deal with th this issue. Okay, and and guidelines as to how to actually figure that out. The next one is where can well reports be found? There is if you go onto the the Department of Consumer Protection uh, website. Um, there is a link, and 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 you can. I think there's a a link. It says something like home homeowners or something like this, and I can't remember exactly where you could do a search for for water wells, and then you'll come across a site where the where they have what are called TIF files, and you can do a search uh, there. But it's basically listed by town and then by date, and it's very difficult to find if you have a, if you're a homeowner and you want to find your completion report. It's an effort to do that. And you also need a special TIF reader, although you can download those from the web. Uh, but it's basically you're just going to go through. If you know when your house was constructed or the well was constructed, this can help. But uh, by and large, it's a very circuitous or very difficult, I shouldn't say circuitous, but very difficult uh, to actually look it up. Okay. If you uh, contact us and uh, tell me where you live, I'll, I'll get a student to do a, to do a search. Okay. And let's see if we can help you. Okay, out. Uh, for private wells, are the requirements for testing natural pollutants like arsenic, radon, radionuclides? Uh, actually, no. Okay, Pri for private well testing, um, uh, now when you talk about requirements, okay, the only time I know of a uh, requirement applies is basically maybe during a, uh, when you're trying to get a certificate of occupancy. Other than that, we, the Department of Health and I, most people would recommend you do your water quality, get water quality analyzed every year. But typically, the constituents that they analyze are very limited in, in, in number. Like they might be interested in nitrate, for example, and things like this. But but whether or not you're going to analyze for arsenic or not usually is a. Uh, I think the local sanitarians established that. I'm not sure whether or not the state is actually now causes cause calls call, calls that a a, requ a required constituent today. But uh, it's probably a good idea, okay. but nonetheless, I, what I would suggest to everyone, if you want to know what to analyze, contact your local sanitarian, uh, and they know what's going on in your neighborhood, whether or not there's a salt problem or an arsenic problem or, or a chemical, or some other chemical problem. Those are the people I would contact first before I would actually uh, go out to a lab and, and, and get a water sample. And this is sort of uh, following up on that a little bit. Does UConn provide water testing to the public? Um, they do provide soil testing. And if not, any recommendations on how to get this done? All right. Well, there, you have yes. The UConn does provide uh, water testing. There is a cost to it. Uh, you can contact Chris Perkins if if you have a pen. Okay. Uh, Chris Perkins. He's at 860-486-2668. That's 860-486-2668. Chris is the uh, director of the laboratory at the Center for Environmental Science and Engineering, uh, and uh, and they could steer you. Uh, the other option is you again you contact your local sanitarian. You can find out if there's laboratories in your neighborhood, okay, that you can actually use and who they would recommend. So the next question is about uh, the use of copper on the outside of buildings, um, as has been done at uh, UConn, and where it's exposed to the elements and can leach into the water supply. Is there any current or pending legislation to address this, and is it an issue? I really can't address that. I, I don't. I don't know of any issue associated with this in terms of groundwater contamination. But if you do, uh, you can let me know. Okay. And uh, but I don't know of any. Um, 
uh, analog, but there, there are people that have actually looked at this. Perhaps the person to contact in this regard might be Mike Dietz at the University of Connecticut and is in our extension program. Um, he, uh, I, he's done a lot of this type of work. Also Jack Clausen, okay, as well in my department, the Natu Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. And then what about reliance of large water companies, Aquarium, Connecticut Water, RWA, um, on groundwater sources? That's the whole question. Uh, I'm not sure. Is, is that a concern, I guess, the reliance of those companies on groundwater? I, I don't I don't see that as an issue. Okay, I, I'm not exactly sure what the what the question is, but nonetheless, if you if you're talking about that trustworthiness, I trust. Them. Okay, you know. Okay, <laughs> it's, uh, but, okay. How is the safe uh, maximum pumping rate of a municipal well determined? Well, I think most of the time. The pumping rate of a municipal well is established on the basis of uh, what the formation can give, okay, and uh, what the zone of contribution might be. For example, uh, if you have a very high permeable environment, you could pump hundreds of gallons a minute, assuming you need it. I mean, the first thing you start out is askers, they, they ask themselves, you know, how much water do I need? Um, and, uh, and then given the permeability of an environment, how much water can I get out, okay, uh, and all. Uh, most of the time, this, the safe yield issue comes up when you're actually in the vicinity of a of a surface water body, and you don't want to have, the, uh, or or say a wetlands, for example, and you don't want to have a, uh, uh, some sort of significant Im negative impact, and and then that requires basically a site by site uh, analysis, um, and where you actually look at uh, what happens when you pump different uh, different rates, and we could do this today. We have models that we use. Uh, to, and, and we can verify and calibrate these models by putting in wells and things of this nature uh, to actually make that decision. Then, uh, has anyone used well drilling data to map groundwater over the area of Connecticut? Oh, yes. Uh, and a, a, a lot of people, in essence, including us. But, uh, you know, the primary source for, for groundwater data in our state and aquifer data in the state is the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, they have a, 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 one of their district offices is in East Hartford. Um, and you can find a lot of information about the state's water supply uh, and groundwater conditions on the USGS uh, website. Uh, USGS.gov, and then you can just search water, or search Connecticut, and and all, or you can contact them um, um, in in East Hartford, and they'll steer you in the direction if you're interested in a particular place to know what the water is doing in a, in a particular location. Here's a possibly controversial one: uh, with so much apparent available water, why the big uproar over the MDC Niagara bottling issue? That's a good question. Okay, and. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that was. I think it was more in terms of, as I understand the issue, it wasn't, it, it, one, there was a concern regarding what happens in an emergency condition situation. Would they still be bottling water uh, as opposed to providing water from the, this is a reservoir now and that wasn't groundwater. And, uh, um, and so that was one issue. And the, and the other was just the whole issue of, uh, you know, some people are just, just don't want to see a bottled water industry. And, uh, and, uh, and so there were issues like that. Okay, and I would suggest that if you want to know more details, there's certainly a lot that was put up online and all, and you can certainly contact uh, people at the, the state legislature and all and, uh, in dealing with that. So then uh, this one goes to the research that you and Dietz have been doing. Uh, what precautions, if any, are being taken to help prevent de-icing slash salting road contamination in groundwater? That is an excellent question. And, uh, um, and and I really have no good answer for that question. Um, that's what we're actually trying to explore now: is what are the alternatives, uh, not just necessarily um, uh, the alternatives in terms of the chemicals, but in, in terms of how and how much do you actually place on the ground? Where do you place it? Where don't you place it? Uh, for example, there are zones. I know, for example, you see some of these signs around the state that tell uh, workers from DOT who are who are doing salting, you know, not to salt a particular area because it's a, a aquifer or or, or a um, an aquifer zone or it, or it's a um, uh, a surface water body nearby reservoir area, um, and so they won't salt. But nonetheless, as you, I don't know if you've noticed this, everybody, but uh, if you look, go to very shopping malls, you have plenty of salt being deposited, more so than I think I've ever remembered, okay, as well. And, uh, 
And so it's a question of what do they do uh, with that salt, where does that go? And we are actually working on different types of, of of approaches uh, in, in dealing with that, uh, and uh, we're starting a major study all around the state looking at uh, looking at salt, particularly in bedrock wells. If anyone out there has uh, some salted bedrock wells, we'd be very interested in, in, in talking to you about sampling. Um, so back to the saltwater intrusion issue, it sounds like wells are technically susceptible to saltwater intrusion. How high is the risk in Connecticut, and have there been examples of contamination perhaps exacer exacerbated by drought conditions? You know, I think there actually is one, there's one area, it could be near you know, East Lyme or Old, um, uh, or Old Saybrook, I can't remember this offhand, but there is, if you look, go back and look at that map I showed you, of uh, there is an, one area that's impacted very close to the coast. So basically, if you're near the coast, it's, it potentially is a problem, and it's just a question of how close are you. Uh, to the coast, and, they, and, as I, and again, I say that uh, if sea level was rising, uh, that would be a problem. The same thing is true with the drought. Remember, if you have a drought, that lowers the thickness of the freshwater lens that allows salt water now to rise, okay? And so it, could, it certainly could exacerbate the problem. But I, I want you to also keep something else in mind, and that is even with this drought, the drought is primarily a surface phenomena, okay? And that is we still have plenty of water in the ground, and the difference, if you looked at those diagrams I showed you, you know, maybe, uh, although we're low, you know, we're, we're certainly less than, you know, 10 feet uh, um, lower than what we normally would be, okay? Even though that might be significant from the standpoint of pumping, it may not be very significant with respect to the thickness of a freshwater lens that we have. Okay, and this last one is more of a comment, I think, than a question. It comes from somebody at Deep who is responding to the issue about copper. They just said that copper is rarely a drinking water issue. We use copper pipes, after all, often to bring us the water. Um, co copper has a lower threshold for impacting aquatic life, so cosmetic use of copper fixtures and roofing could possibly pose a risk to nearby wetlands and small streams. So just following up on that question about the copper use on buildings on campus and things like that. So, well, that's all the questions we have. I thank you all for um, tuning into the webinar, and I uh, especially thank uh, Dr. Gary Robbins for um, this excellent overview. And as I said, this uh, presentation was recorded and will be posted on our website hopefully in a couple of days. If you have follow-up questions for Dr. Robbins, you can email him at the address that's on your screen uh, now. And with that, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much, folks.